Okay, so the cerebellum, like, like virtually all places in the brain, has a topography. And the topography is fairly straightforward. Uh, if you look at this cartoon, what you'll see is that there is a central portion, and this is a, a, a structurally delimited portion. You can see a groove between this vermis and the hemispheres. So the central portion of the cerebellum is called the, the vermis, and then there are two, hemis two hemispheres or lobes. These are called lobes or hemispheres, cerebellar lobes, cerebellar hemispheres. And there is a, a um, portion in the medial, the medial stretch of the, of the lobes uh, is a region called the paravermis. Now, the lateral border of this paravermis is very poorly defined. Okay, so it's, it's a little stretch here, but the lateral border is a, is a guesstimate. And then, so we talk about, we talk about three major region, regions, the vermis, the paravermis, and then the lateral parts of the hemispheres, or the lateral lobes, or the lateral hemispheres. So that's not the entire hemisphere, that's the lateral part, the part that does not include the ver paravermis. So what are these three parts uh, do? Well, the vermis is involved in speech, gait, posture, and stance. Posture and stance being very similar. Okay, um, so uh, this is really critical to, to midline movements, and those are speech, gait, uh, posture. Uh, it's also involved, it, it also has an involvement in eye movements. The entire cerebellum has an, eye, an involvement in, in eye movements. The paravermis, on the other hand, has more to do with appendicular movements. So reaching and grasping are the main jobs of the uh, paravermis. So what's left for the lateral lobes? The lateral lobes are a, a, a more, it, are more poorly defined. They're, they are less well defined, uh, it, it, or they're less direct in, in their um, functions. In fact, you can have lesions of stretches of the lateral hemisphere without any obvious dramatic motor deficits. There are those lesions. Whereas if you have a lesion in the vermis or the paravermis, there is extreme, it is extremely likely that there will be a motor effect, a motor consequence to that lesion. So the way I would suggest that you think about the lateral lobes is that they are critical for a couple of things. One is eye-hand coordination. Again, the entire cerebellum is very, very important for, for um, eye movements. Um, parts of the lateral lobe are are critical for, for example, uh, coordinating smooth pursuit movements. Uh, the other thing that these lateral lobes are very important for is learning new movements. And what, regardless of what part of the body they, they use, um, if you are an adult and you want to learn, you want to teach yourself a new dance step um, or a new sport or a new instrument, uh, some new way of using your body, it is going to be the lateral hemispheres, the lateral lobes that are going to work with parts of, of frontal cortex in order to coordinate that new learned movement, that new movement that you're going to learn. Uh, a couple of other points here. One is that this bottom little bit is called the flocculonodular lobe. Uh, the flocculonodular lobe is, is the part of um, the cerebellum most concerned with eye movements, most critical. So it is sometimes called the vestibulo the, or the archicerebellum, the vestibulocerebellum. And um, it is lesions in this flocculus, flocular le region that lead you to no longer be able to modulate your vestibulocular reflex, your VOR. Okay, so this is really critical to eye movements, in particular um, out here to, to the VOR. Uh, another point that I should make before we go to the next slide is that there is a, there's a, um, a large fissure here that separates, if we're looking uh, sort of down on this from the top, and there's a large fissure that separates a smaller anterior zone from um, a, a uh, 
from a larger um, from the, the larger rest of the cerebellum. It is this anterior zone where uh, lesions have the greatest clinical effect. Okay. So, in addition to this topography, where there's a midline of the cerebellum is going to deal with midline movements and paravermis is going to deal with appendicular movements. There is also a topography, or there is a structure to the cerebellum, in, and we can see it here. If you zoom in here, what you see is the spinal cord back here, the medulla, the pons, and here we're not we're not dead midline. We're off on the side where there's a peduncle. Here's part of a peduncle reaching out to the uh, to the cerebellum. So here's the cerebellum. This is, uh, I believe, the fold that sh separates the anterior lobe from the central and posterior lobes. Um, and here, this is actually the superior cerebellar peduncle coming out. It's going to cross. Remember, it's going to cross in the very caudal part of, of the midbrain. But what I really want you to see here is that just as was true in the cerebral cortex, there is an outer rind of gray matter with underlying white matter. So this is a, a, a fresh uh, slice through the brain. This is unstained. And you can see this outer rind of gray matter. And that is the cerebellar cortex, OK? So what we're going to see in a moment is that there are actually three major areas um, in the cerebellum. One is the cerebellar cortex. One is the white matter. And then down here, you can actually see this. We'll see it again in a, in a more favorable way. This gray matter down here is not cortex. It's not on the peel surface. It's deep cerebellar nuclei. OK, so let's just review that. Deep cerebellar nuclei at the are, are nuclei that are in the base, in the deep depths of the cerebellum. There's white matter, and there's a rind of cerebellar cortex. Cerebellar cortex is a three-layered cortex. It is a much simpler cortex than, um, than either neocortex or, say, three-layered hippocampal cortex. So in the, in the next video, we're going to look at the basic circuits of the cerebellum.